Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, if you're able, would you uh, stand up so that we can worship our God together? And um, let me start with a quick word of prayer. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for bringing us together, for um, giving us this beautiful morning to wake up to. And I pray that as we sing the words today, that you will receive our worship um, with gladness and with rejoicing. We love you, Father. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Light of the world. <clears throat>
with rocks. Who else would rocks cry out to worship? Whose glory taught the stars to shine? would die for our redemption. Who else would die for our redemption? Whose resurrection means all rise? There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done. But I have eternity to try. everything that we have. Our hope is built on you and what you've done. May Father, we come before you with so little to offer. In fact, we have nothing to offer. We come empty-handed. Yet, Father, you accept us for who we are, and you sent Jesus to die for us on the cross. We're so grateful for you. We lift up this time to you now into your hands. May you open our hearts to your word, and may your Holy Spirit work in us so that we can become more and more like Jesus each day. We love you, Father. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Sunday school. Um, I trust the adults can accompany them um, and <laughs> sign, sign folk in. Um, but yeah, at the end, of course, uh, remember to sign the kids back out. Thank you. So while, while Sunday school gets settled, if I can again just extend a, a warm welcome to our uh, visitors who are coming for the very first time. Um, and at the same time, I trust on the way in, you would have uh, collected um, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the wine and bread as we'll be celebrating uh, communion a little bit later on. So um, onward to our notices um, this week. Um, 
Okay, thanks, Deb. Yeah, so um, next week, um, Josh will be uh, preaching on the message of Hebrew 3. I guess uh, let us prepare our hearts ready to receive uh, that message also. Um, and I think following, um, if I can just give a, a, I think this is one of these mark the date type of announcements. So um, on the 25th of May, it's a, a very special day, that one. Um, between the 25th and the 27th of May, um, we are uh, planning a, a retreat uh, in, in English. Um, the Pioneer Center is actually a really cool venue um, just outside Kidderminster um, with, with good facilities and, and so forth. But yeah, we, we look forward to um, uh, joining you on that, that day. Um, registration will be open very soon. Shall we now come to a time of uh, giving? Can I invite the, the stewards to um, um, come together to, to collect? At the same time, there are many ways to, to um, um, give to the church and to tithe. Um, um, I think that code means something if you, if you use your phone or something um, back in my day. Um, we do things differently, but that's, that's okay. Um, <laughs> And yeah, um, if you are a, 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 a taxpayer in the UK, there's a way to um, register to give aid. <coughs> so the, the, there is additional giving that comes from that. Shall we now just um, come together um, for a, a time of prayer um, before we receive the, the message? Father in heaven, we quieten our hearts before you, Lord. Um, we give you this offering as a token of our thanks. And we pray that it may further your kingdom. We pray for our city, Lord, the city of Birmingham. It is a busy city with lots of people. And yet at the same time, it is a city of need. There is poverty. In material terms and also in spiritual terms. So, Father, let us be your servants in this city. Give us a renewed heart so that we know how to love our people here in a practical way. Give us a renewed mind so that we can read your word and convey the message from this to the people around in a really touching way. And give us a new soul that comes from the hope that your kingdom will come. It will come because of your son's death on the cross. And so we pray in his most holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Whoa, sorry, I'm so much louder. Uh, thanks a lot, Terrence. I uh, hope you guys are doing all right. Uh, nice to see everyone here. Uh, it's getting, it's, the weather is really confusing, right? It's, it was warm last week, then it got cold again, uh, and hopefully it will stay uh, milder uh, as we head into spring. Um, so uh, our, our year theme this year is Jesus is Lord, and it's really on this idea of trying to have us, I think, think more and reflect more on what it means to be under Jesus' authority and his rule. Um, and the next series that we're going into for the next uh, quite, quite a few weeks is we're going to be looking through the book of Hebrews. And one of the reasons we picked the, picked the, book, picked the, book, of, picked the book of Hebrews uh, was because it really talks about Jesus. Uh, there's this big emphasis, and it's almost this whole explanation of why Jesus is Lord. And it's written essentially to people who were Jewish of background, and I'm guessing most of us aren't Jewish in background. But the more you understand both Jesus' Jewish past 
and actually why that brings this beautiful picture of how he's this perfect picture of salvation for us. Um, it lets us appreciate both Jesus' majesty and his power and his authority a little bit more. It also helps us to figure out, well, what does it mean that Jesus really is our Lord and Savior? So we're going to be flying through actually chapters 1 and 2 today uh, and having a look at that a little bit more. Um, and again, it is very much about Jesus. The book opens up just talking about actually how Jesus is greater and better than anything else. Uh, let me start by, by reading this part. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs, not combined with the word Hebrews and sort of this craziness. Um, in this very first section, they're laying out that actually Jesus, who was there at the creation of the world, who was involved in the creation of the world, who is much more uh, greater than any other creation, one of the things that it starts highlighting is that he's more powerful, more important than something like angels. It kind of lists these things out, right? That Jesus, he himself, he is the, the radiance. He's the appointed the heir of all things. He created the world. His radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe, and he makes purification for our sins. Like, these are some big terms, these big ideas, these big Christian kind of phrases. But there's a sense that Jesus, who was from the beginning, is on one hand eternal, he is the one who spoke all things into existence, but he's also the one that makes purification for our sins. In other words, he writes the wrongs that we've done and brings us back into this relationship with God. You could summarize those phrases in this idea that he is divine, he is eternal, he is sovereign over all, he is glorious, he is almighty, and he is a savior. So in each of those things, if we think about what it means for us to worship God, to be in a relationship with God, to know God. So when I think a lot about faith or knowing God, it's kind of this interesting thing. So if you grow up without knowing God, if you grow up in like an atheist society or if you grow up in Britain and you just go to uh, RERS lessons, you just go there every week and you learn about faith, you're learning about religion, you learn about Islam, you learn about uh, Sikhism, you start putting all these things into the same box, the same box of all faiths are the same, and they all kind of worship a God. And normally you stand on two camps. You stand on the side, which is like, well, I don't believe in a God. I believe we're just all made by a random collision of, you know, things, and that's how we come to existence. So I don't want to believe in a God. Or the other camp, which is, I believe in a God. And I've chosen this one. And it's almost like, oh, yeah, I, I, I go to the supermarkets to buy my food. I don't grow my own. So, and I've chosen to shop at Morrison's. And I think that's sometimes what we think about God, right? We think about faith. It's just one that we've picked from. But at the end of the day, we can all get our groceries from somewhere. Now, if there is no God, if there's no God, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, you can pick from whichever supermarket you want. But there's something in most of us that resonates that there must be something more. And it comes in things like when we know that there's injustice, when we see war, and we can know that one side is being wrong. We can grieve at the agony of death. When we watch a movie and we see love, or we experience love, or we see the love of a family, those are things that resonate a little bit deeper than just something. And you have to ask, where does that stuff come from? Where does this desire for righteousness or for what goodness is or for justice or for love? Are those things that just come up from society? I don't know, because if you look at society, they don't care about a lot of those things. And yet those things resonate something deeper in us. And those things come from a creator. They come from something beyond us that has instilled in humanity those values. It's that picture of that we were made in the image of God. That at the core of things, the deepest cores of Jesus and God, his values, are resonating and imprinted in us. 
in this desire then to say, okay, if there is a God, is there a true God? Is there a God that is beyond all the other gods? Because you can't just worship. You can't just say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. I'm going to pick any gods. Now, as you're from an Asian heritage background, you might know this because there's lots of gods to pick from. You can pick from Gunyam. You can pick from, I actually don't know any Chinese gods. I'm very bad at this. So, but that's the only one I know. I'm not even sure what they look like. But anyways, you can pick from your gods. And I know some people, they're like, well, this God didn't answer my prayer, so I'm going to go pray to this God. And I know someone who's like, well, I also believe in Jesus just in case. You know, like I want to cover all my bases. That's not really God, right? If there is a God, he or she or whatever pronoun you want to use, the God Almighty needs to be the one who made everything else. It has to be the top of the top. And so the author of Hebrews, this is what he's trying to get at. Jesus is not just a good guy. He's not just another prophet. He's just not a nice man. He's not just a good teacher. He is God Almighty. He is divine, eternal, sovereign, like Lord over all. But not just that, glorious and almighty. And finally, our Savior. One of the beautiful things about Christianity, one of the beautiful things about Christianity, and, and it's difficult for a lot of people to understand, is like, why is there Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Why is there a trinity? Why can't it, I, don't you just worship one God? It's that, almost that picture of understanding, actually, if our God was just so singular that we could grasp him, understand him so simply, then he wouldn't be beyond our understanding. But to know that God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is both completely unique yet completely one, still the one God, makes us appreciate the fact that this is not just something we can come up with, but something beyond us. The beautiful thing about Jesus is that in his perfection, in being God, his existence here on earth makes a way for us to then be saved. And in the chapters 1 and 2, he, the author unfolds why this is the case. And we forget to that point, this idea that Jesus is God Almighty, is this idea that nothing compares to him. There is no equal. There's nothing along the way that can kind of even compare. He is king. He is ruler. He is Lord over all. And again, throughout this year, we're going to be meditating and marinating on this idea of what it means for Jesus' lordship to be over us. So the passage goes on, and it starts talking about angels, right? For, and, and the premise here is, as the author's writing, is actually basically Jesus is better than angels. Like, he's above them. Whatever mystical, magical, supernatural being you think is important, Jesus is beyond them. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same and your years will never end. He's pointing out this difference between what is talked about in the scriptures about Jesus versus the angels. Like the angels, these are created, but Jesus, he is Lord of their all. You are sovereign. You are my own. You are one and the same with me. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Jesus is better than angels. That is the first point out. Now, for all of you guys, you'll be like, so what? Oh, well, I already know that. You know, I don't worship angels. I'm not... Bert, this is a pointless point. You could have saved us three minutes by not talking about this. Okay, so, and here's the point. And this is what was happening before. They're worshiping the created. They're worshiping what they think is supernatural. And that's what happens to us. If you're elevating something else above Jesus, you've got it wrong. So if you're worshiping the creation above the creator, you've got it wrong. So you might say, yeah, that's true. I don't 
I don't worship angels. Probably because you're like, well, I don't see him. I don't really believe. I'm not sure how much I believe in angels. But I know what you do worship. Maybe FIFA Mobile. Maybe your phone. Maybe sports. It could be anything that draws our heart attention more. And now we're not saying these things are necessarily bad. We're not saying that God created angels are not bad. We're not saying the things here created on earth aren't necessarily bad. But when our love for them or our attention or desire for them starts to surpass our desire and our love for Jesus, we've got it wrong. The second part is if you are worshiping the miraculous, you've got it wrong. And there are those of us who chase the miraculous, who want to hear about the miracles, but we forget the one who is creating the miracles. We want to pray to see God do something, but when he doesn't do those things, we turn to something else. And I know this happens too, uh, and a lot of people from uh, Asian heritage backgrounds, like they'll be praying to one thing, and they'll be asking God, can you answer this prayer? And then when they don't get the answer they want, they turn their eyes to something else. Okay, that's fine. I will go to my Chinese... Uh, herbalist who will provide me with some answers to things. or And it's this desire to search for something that's going to fulfill. Instead of realizing, if Jesus is our Lord, good or bad or whatever outcome we de demand out of him, it's still second to the fact that his truth, his lordship is above us. It's a humble submission to say, but actually, Jesus, you know better, and I trust you. I trust you more so than anything else. I follow you. The last one, of course, is if you're worshiping the theories, you've got it wrong. When your love so much is in the knowledge or the understanding or the wrestling with things, or sometimes you're chasing the other way, you're chasing conspiracy theories to imagine there must be some mystical Illuminati that both Beyonce and Jay-Z are part of that is running the world. You're chasing dreams or fantasies, trying to make a logic for yourself. You forget that actually we are still under the power of God. For this idea, for him to bring up this idea of angels, he's trying to combat this idea that sometimes people are like elevating angels above the status they should. Or this theory maybe that maybe Jesus was just an angel. And it's the same kind of thing that we have today, right? People chasing some conspiracy theories down some dark corner of the internet. Or believing something that they think is more important. And every time we do that, we're taking our eyes off the true and living Savior. We're not even reading the Bible for his truth. We're just pursuing empty dreams. The truth of the matter is it's much simpler than we think. Turning to Jesus, reading his word, seeking him, praying to him. They're all things any of us can do. And any of us, depending on how smart you are, how not smart you feel, all of us can still engage with God's word. All of us can pray, and all of us can come to him. One of the beautiful things we see in the gospel is it didn't matter your educational background, your financial status, all of them could come to Jesus. And if you notice in the gospel, there's always this difference between those who are desperate for the one that they love to be healed, and they're bringing their come to Jesus, those who are listening to his word, and they're eager to hear what he's teaching, versus those who are saying, Come on, Jesus, show us another sign. Do another miracle, then we'll believe in you. There are those who are focusing on the wrong part. And I think sometimes we get too caught up in other things. And we forget, actually, sometimes it is as simple as just worshiping him, praying to him, reading the Bible and just saying, okay, God, I don't understand. Can you help me understand? Letting the words actually just speak his comfort, his truth into your life. Letting his peace rest on your heart. Jesus is not trying to be complicated. He really just wants to engage with you, to know you. And it's resting in that place to say, okay, God, at the very core of me, I want to know if you are the true and living God. And I want... I, I need you to speak to me because I want to serve the true and living one. I don't want to just chase empty notions. 
Jesus is above creation. He's above the miraculous. He's above the theories. And so we'll read on. We must, be, we, must pay, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. This passage, right, it's pointing out two things. Look, because of Jesus, because of what he's done, because of the salvation we received, because of the life that he's given us, because of the moment that we knew that Jesus is real, we have to be careful that we don't drift away. We don't get lost. And it happens to us sometimes, right? You might chase a conspiracy theory down one corner of the internet. You might get so caught up with the created things of this world that you forget about what's important. You might get so busy with your own work. You might get so busy just serving in the church that you forget actually what this is all really about. And in doing so, you start drifting away from the truth of who Jesus is and the salvation that we've received. We have to be careful that we don't drift away. We didn't sort of drift away. So this, this yesterday, no, yesterday, what day is today? Today's Sunday, yeah, sorry. On Friday, so on Friday, I'm running the uh, younger youth group now of uh, year seven to nine boys, right? Colin, no, that's, do you feel sorry for me? I know, it's a, it's a bit touch and go, right? It's pretty, it was intense. So this week, we had like 20, 20 kids upstairs. It's gone mad, Terrence, since. Uh, and it was me and Brian, uh, and we dragged one girl leader to come experience the chaos. It's also 17 boys and three girls. So it's, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty full on. And uh, I was, you know, I'm, we're trying to talk about Jesus walking on water, and I'm trying to get them to focus and have a discussion. But at the end of it, and I'm taking this as a precious gem, because I, even as I tell you this, that there was some quality that came out of it, look, 90% of it was chaos. But at the end, I was saying, you know, what are some, some things that keep us distracted, that like Peter in the storm, you know, when he sees Jesus walking and starts to sink, what things distract us? And someone immediately said, things like video games. Before you know it, you're sinking, and you don't realize it. And you can't lose, you lose sight of Jesus, and you don't know where to grab, because you're lost in your own world. This is that same kind of idea. Before you know it, you're drifting away. You've lost sight of what you're doing. And it, and it sneaks up on you so quickly, Right? You come to church one week, you don't feel the vibes, the worship wasn't all there, you're like, oh, next week, do I have the energy to get up? So my friend in Malaysia, he became a Christian in Sheffield, and uh, he, before that, he didn't really believe in Jesus, and then he became a Christian here, and so he, during his university years, he, every Sunday he was at church, he was praying before meals, he was really alive, and then he went back to Malaysia, and, and then he was like, oh, I don't know any Christians, what's gonna happen, and he, he remembers he went to work, and he was in a big canteen, and he was sitting there, and he thought to myself, okay, back in Sheffield, I would pray before every meal. So he's sitting there, he's like, but, but now I'm back here in Malaysia, and like if I pray before this meal, everyone will look at me. So he was like, oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, and he thought to himself, look, if I don't pray today, it'll be harder tomorrow. And then after that, I'll, I'll, he could tell he would slowly drift away. So he did what any normal human would do in the situation. He prayed for 30 minutes. No, he just closed his eyes, prayed very quickly, and then opened his eyes again. And he said as soon as he opened his eyes, he saw someone stand up from across the room and start walking towards him. He thought to himself, oh, my gosh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> this is a Muslim country. I'm going to be kicked out of my job that I just started. This guy walks over to him, and he says, were you just praying? And this guy, obviously, at that point, like, well, I've already prayed. Should I lie as well? You know, just throw it. So, so he's like, uh, uh, yes, I was praying. He said, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I'm, I'm a Christian as well, and we actually have a prayer meeting. And, and for, it was one of those things where when you lean into God and you keep trusting him, he might open doors that you would have missed. Because he thinks to himself, if he chose not to pray that day, maybe he never hears about this prayer meeting because the next day he forgets. 
when we understand how precious salvation is, when we understand how wonderful it is for what Jesus has done in our life, there, there's this change in us to be like, I don't ever want to do things which might make me drift away, where I get lost or I lose focus. I love it so much. You know, uh, when, you, when you see little kids and they get something new, sometimes they'll, they'll love it so much. They'll always want to sleep with it. They want to hold on to it. They want to bring it to bed with them. They want to care all the time. They love it so much that it starts getting worn down. Now, many of you would have seen the soft toy. You would have had your own, which used to be yellow or a bright colored. And over the years, it's now gray. They always become gray. It doesn't matter what it was before. But they get loved so much, they become gray. And it happens because they hold on to it so dearly, they never want to lose it. When we think about the salvation that God's given us, right? not just salvation, when we think about the relationship that we have with Jesus and how precious it is, when you think about any peace or any assurance or any love that you've had from him, all his faithfulness, all the examples of his goodness and mercy in your life, even when he convicts you of sin, and all those things, you would be like, actually, I don't ever want to lose you from my life. I wouldn't want us to ever be separated. That's the preciousness of it. And the author of Hebrews is trying to get people to start saying, it's not just how great Jesus is, it's how beautiful this relationship we have with him. That for, even as he's writing to the Jewish people, as Jews, you have a greater appreciation of this. But for all of us, we also see, wow, how wonderful it is to be children of God. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? Instead of wondering about whether we lose it, it's like, how much do I want to hold on to it so that it never leaves me? Like, I never lose sight of that. Jesus is the bringer of salvation. He is the one that opens that door that makes the way for us to be saved. And he does this because he is both fully God and fully human. Like in this perfection, and you can only maybe, I, maybe quantum physics may one day help us understand this more, but for whatever reason or another, there's this perfect divinity of God matched with this perfect humanness. Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It's in his divinity, his perfection, that his sacrifice then becomes the kind of sacrifice that saves all of us. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. That line there, just unpacking this, is, is saying that, Jesus' death on that cross, his holiness, his divinity, his sacrifice. His death pays the cost of sin for all of us. We all deserve to die, and yet he pays for that. In his resurrection, in his holiness, another one, the one who makes people holy himself, and all of us who are made holy because of him are then part of the same family. We're connected. And so Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. It's this picture of Jesus absolutely victorious over everything. He gives us holiness. He calls us brothers and sisters, and he's not ashamed of us. Now, this is, this is interesting because I think for definitely of Asian heritage background, um, gives us holiness. Like, we all know we've gone wrong many times. Our parents are very good at telling us what we've done wrong, not so good at telling us what we've done right. So we're always sure where we fall short. It's very clear where you fall short. You fall short in your exams. You fall short in what school they hoped you'd go into. You fall short in your career. And we carry that weight for us. And of course, that then knocks on to the next stage, which is um, are we still close to the family? Like when your parents shout you too much or your siblings, you're compared to them and you're not as good, at some point you feel like, I'm not even good enough to be in this family. Where do I fit in here? And that last line, which is, you know your parents are ashamed of you or you feel that they're ashamed of you. 
I think definitely for me growing up in the Asian heritage thing, and uh, I, in hindsight, to let you know, kids who are feeling sad and wallowing now, your parents do this because they believe it will motivate you to work harder. Because not in the West, that kind of motivation is the gyasu motivation, which will make you excel to greater heights because they believe in your potential. That's why they do it. But from the West perspective, it all feels like, you just don't love me. You just don't care about me. And the parents are like, I care about you. That's why I shout. That's why you have to do 600 math problems before sleep. That's right. So it's, like a, it's a different perspective. Anyways, the way we feel is the sense of like, I'm not good enough. I'm not able to. And so then I don't know if I belong in this family. And then finally, I can sense that feeling of shame. Like, the opposite is happening with Jesus, right? He's like, yeah, you guys have all fallen short. But by my grace and my love, I redeemed you. And I've made you holy. There's this beautiful dichotomy, which is I've made you holy, and I'm making you holy at the same time. Every time you fall short is another chance for you to grow. Not to wallow in shame that, oh, I failed again, I've sinned again. Rather, God is saying, no, I've made you holy, so get up and try again and walk in holiness. Not exist in holiness, even though you have been made holy. Walk in holiness. Keep learning how to be better. And then the last thing is, he's not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Like, how precious is that? If, I mean... Really, I think if Jesus looks at any of our lives, he can look at me like, really? I, you're like my 10th cousin, maybe, like removed. I don't know if I'll call you my brother or my sister. Like, and yet in this passage, there's this warm embrace of us being called his brothers and sisters. The questions I have for this that challenge us is like, look, if Christ gives us holiness, why do we keep rejecting it? Like, if we know God's smart. We know he's good. We know his plans are right. We know his lordship is, is worthwhile. We know that he is loving, that he welcomes us into this, and he's calling us to walk in this right way. Why do we keep not stumbling into sin? It's not, I'll tell you, with sin, most of the time it doesn't happen because we did it by accident. Most of the time we did it because we knew we were doing it, and we still chose to do it. It's it's active choosing to turn away from God's holiness to pursue what we have here. And it's, it's kind of saying, actually, God, I don't want to reject that holiness anymore because of how wonderful your salvation, how wonderful this relationship with you is, how wonderful this is to be embraced by you. I don't want to keep turning away from that. I want to keep living with you. Um, so a few years ago, I was doing uh, university work. I was uh, a little bit more involved in the university students. And uh, I went into one of the university students' flats, and I remembered, I remembered what it was like in university because um, they had a shared kitchen. And in this shared kitchen, there was one bin. And in this one bin, it must have been piled so high that you knew it was a Jenga game going, because it was, and I know I'm not very tall, but it was still above my, the plane of my head. And I'm like, this is both miraculous that they can balance so much rubbish, and yet kind of disconcerting, because we're moving into, like, health hazard, fire hazard kind of zone. The other thing that I loved about university student accommodation kitchens is as you walk in, it's like walking into the Odin at New Street. You can hear the stickiness on the floor wherever you go. Um, and, and I remember those days, because when I was a university student, it didn't seem that bad. It was like, okay, right? Like, that's like normal living. And then I grew up, and I realized, oh, you can have nice things. Your, your forks don't have to have food on them, like, crusted on. And when you start living in those environments, it's really hard to go back. It's really difficult to then hang out with university students in their flat for any extended period of time. Now, it's not a moment of judgment, although there might be some implications of keeping your places cleaner. But there is a sense of when you understand how great it is to be close with God, when you start drifting back into those old spaces, you just start feeling like, oh, actually, I don't like this. I'm not that comfortable here. It's not about casting judgment, but rather saying how precious and how wonderful it is to be close to Jesus. 
We've been talking about last week this idea of us being divine ambassadors. When you love the holiness of God so much, it's not about walking in the space and judging and pointing like how sticky it is, but it's almost like the love of God that radiates from you inspires people to be like this, to draw close to you too, to want to be the same way. And it's almost like inviting these university students, hey, come to my house for a bit. They come to your house and be like, oh my gosh, this stuff is clean. I could take off my socks here and not pick up some sort of fungus. It's amazing, right? There's this, and, and then so much so that when they experience that, they go back to their place like, all right, maybe I'm inspired to change as well. It's, it's beautiful because Jesus is calling us in this space of divine ambassadoring. Like we are rating his life so much that it draws people close to him. And when we're talking about holiness, it's not, it's not just against sin. It's the sins that we also don't think about. Jealousy, bitterness, hate, fear, anxiety, those things. They're saying, actually, God, I don't, I don't need to have those things hold on to me. But I want my life to just be alive with you, emanating your goodness in every single way. The second thing is, and if Christ is not ashamed of you, why are you ashamed of him? If you know Christ is not ashamed of you, like, why are we still like, oh, yeah, what are you doing? What, what did you guys do this weekend? You go, oh, oh, I just hung out with my family. And, you know, just slept in, slept in. And why do you have to lie that you went to church? Is it that shameful? Is it that bad? If, if it is, you can come talk to me afterwards. I won't, I won't feel offended. But there is this sense of like saying, actually, I don't, I don't want to be ashamed of Jesus. Last week in the evening service, I didn't give the example, but I said it's like when you're the only Chinese person amongst all your English friends, do you become more English all of a sudden? Do you say, oh, I watched EastEnders this past weekend and like stuff like that? You know, like, do you try to shift in because suddenly you're ashamed of, like, if you go to a Chinese restaurant with all your friends, do you order chicken feet? Or do you be like, oh, I don't want to be, I'm going to be, you know, I'll be careful. Do we reject our Christian identity when we're with certain people? because we're ashamed of Jesus. We have to say, like, the flip side is, and I, I don't, I can't believe it, Jesus is not ashamed of us. He knows we can not only live in holiness and walk in holiness, but he wants us to still be there with him, to walk in that life. But the last thing that I draw from this is that, look, if Christ calls us his brothers and sisters, how do we treat the brothers and sisters around us? How do we treat those in this community, other Christians? Like, is there, is there this understanding that in this divine salvation that we've been given, each of you here in this space, you also have that space to, to pray for one another, to, to speak the truth of God alive into people's lives, to encourage each other to walking in holiness, to blessing one another, Whereas maybe a lot of times instead we, we are too busy maybe complaining or, you know, judging or criticizing. Like, why are we fighting people who are on the same team? Why are we fighting the people who are also all struggling to walk in holiness? Like, we don't live as agents of God's wrath and condemnation. We walk as children of grace. What we should be doing in this church is saying, like, actually, how do we keep helping one another Move forward. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Live forward. You can, you can pick any sort of thing to complain about. Anyone can complain about anything all the time. But it takes real power to be like, actually, Jesus, I hone in on you. And I want us to walk in this direction. Not just our church, but all these churches. We are on the same team. Maybe sometimes we differ a little bit theologically or the way we think things should run. That's not the end of the world. But learning how wonderful it is to treat our brothers and sisters differently and to be part of this journey together is what's precious. Towards the end of this passage in chapter 2, then it says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus in his divinity breaks the power of death, breaks the power of fear of death as well. 
and so that we are set free. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Jesus became human so that we could be free from death and the fear of death. There's real victory in this life. It doesn't mean that death is not hard, but it means that we have hope in Christ. So most of us are, are young enough, we aren't on this journey. We're not so close to death. At some point, you are closer to your death than the, your birth, and that's the midlife crisis point. So, um, but, but actually, to actually si- consider your aging and your passing away is a solitary battle, actually. No matter what people say to you, no much encouragement they can have from you, it is still a journey you end up facing on your own. No one can fully understand what pain physically you're suffering or emotionally, except for God, except for Christ. Um, Unless you're able to turn to him, you have nowhere else to hold on to. You might have some comfort from those around you, from family, from people in your lives, your friends and relatives, and they can provide support for you. But for the most part, it is a lonely journey. And for many people, it becomes crippling with fear. We're just trying to figure out ways to stay alive. But with Christ, we know that that is not the end of the story. Not only that, but we have his hope with us. In this world, it is, I I don't think we realize how many people live with this fear of death. When you're in a Christian and you're with a Christian community for a long time, you just start getting used to it. We talk about death so often. It's actually really weird for everybody else. But it's because we have the hope of Jesus. And this world around us yearns for the same kind of peace, the same kind of hope. And it's for us to be able to share that with them. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. And they might make atonement for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. We'll hear more about this idea of what it means to be a high priest and Jesus is a high priest as we go through the book of Hebrews. But the last part of this talks about the fact that in Jesus' perfect humanity, he himself was tempted. So he understands the things that we face. And he's able to help us in that journey too. Jesus overcomes. If Christ understands and has overcome temptation, why don't you ask him for help? Like we are not victims to sin or we're not trapped in that cycle anymore because we can always call on him and ask him, hey, help me. I want to change those habits now. I want to move away from that now so that I can not just live and experience your holiness, but that I can walk in it. Jesus, because of his life, because of his victory, because he's greater than all of creation, because he's the one who is fully divine and fully human, Our challenge is to live unashamed of him. And it's both in our words and our actions, but it's also in our life. The the more you walk in holiness, the less you're ashamed of him because you're not ashamed of yourself. You're like, yeah, I walk with you. So you walk in the holiness he's given you. And then finally, to pray for his strength against temptation. And whether that's in how we treat our brothers and sisters, whether it's how we engage with each other outside of church, It's saying, God, turn my heart away from temptation, but let me draw close to you. Shall I pray? And then we're going to come to a time of communion. Jesus, we we look to you because you are the one who has overcome sin and death. You're the one who understands the challenges of this world, the fears that we might feel. But you're also the one who gives us victory. Because of you, we have this life. We have this eternal life. And you are not just an empty God or a fake God. You are the the true and living one. So let us not be ashamed of you. Let us walk in your holiness and in your life. And we pray for your strength against temptation, that we turn away from this old way of living and walk in the new life of you. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to come to a time of communion now. So if you've been baptized, uh, we invite you to take communion with us. If you haven't been baptized yet, um, but you're still interested, and even though we don't have that QR code up, you can come speak to me or drop me a message, uh, and we will be trying to set up uh, baptism classes at some point soon. 
Um, but if you haven't received one of these uh, communion cups and uh, all-in-one packets, um, just raise your hand now and the stewards will come and bring you one. As that's happening, um, I encourage you to use this time to really come before the Lord. Um, use this time to really say, Jesus, I've been off track with you. I haven't been walking in your holiness. Maybe my brain is cluttered with all these things. And just come to him and say, Jesus, I just simply, I just want to come before you simply. Will you speak to me? Will you forgive me? Will you let me walk with you again? So let's just be still before him. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your sacrifice on the cross. That even in your perfection and your divinity, you chose to become fully human, to be born into this world, to see the pain and suffering, to undergo temptation, and yet come out victorious on the other side. So because you have not succumbed to sin, Lord, will you help us to walk in that same holiness? We let our lives come alive with you. Forgive us because we're sometimes, we're just a lot of times just so scattered, sinking in our own kind of worlds. As you forgive us, we restore us to that joy of salvation in you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, um, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And it's a reminder that not only was Jesus a real person, but his life, in the same way we can touch and hold this bread, he is real. And his sacrifice is real. And in the same way, his victory is real. So I invite you now to open up the top layer of your communion cups. And we'll take it together as a symbol of union. Shall we take the bread? After supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you as a symbol of the new covenant. Take and drink in remembrance of me. In the same way we drink this cup, we remember that actually Jesus' blood was poured out as a sacrifice in payment for our own blood so that we could have life. I invite you to take the cup, to open up the cup layer, and we drink it together in union. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your victory on the cross means that we have new life. We invite your Holy Spirit again to fill us into every place. That as we've been made whole, we are your new temple. Your spirit inspire us, bring us to life as your divine ambassadors, and send us out from here alive in you. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to a time of worship and we come and we reflect on the altar of Jesus, um, you can also have your cups picked up by the stewards. Use this time to be to pray for one another and to worship uh, and give the time over to Nancy now. coming into this time of worship, um, let's bring before God the, the things in our hearts that are weighing down um, our ability to come and be fully present with him. Um, as we, yeah, just in, enter into this time, allow us just to ask for forgiveness for the things that we know we need forgiveness for and to come before this altar uh, of his communion table just to really ask for his love and mercy to shine on us. If you're able to stand, would you please stand and sing with us?
give us the strength, Father, not to rely on our own um, abilities, but really to look to you. Um, I pray that as we go forward this week um, into our workplaces, um, into our families, that you will give us the grace, um, knowing that we can rely on you, and it's you, your hope, it's what you've done on the cross that we can have hope in. As we sing the final song, let's just really proclaim the hope that we have in Jesus, not based on what we've done, but based on what he's done. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much because you are hope in life and death. And so we cling to you. We hold on to you. We don't ever want to drift away. We want to just draw close to you and be with you and delight in your holiness and your goodness and your light always. So now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.
happy to have a seat. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, yeah, grab someone that you haven't had lunch with for lunch, uh, spend time together, and uh, do bring your kids with you because they're still in their classes. <laughs>